David, how was the uh, the opening of the of the series with the credits? How was that shot? How, did you shoot that? Um, I did not shoot that. I came out. We had finished the show, and I came out from L.A. and I had this idea um, for just what you see there. But we, I went on the location scout, and we went for a drive, and we shot some tests. Phil Abraham shot most of it on 16, mm -hmm. and um, I think I was there for the shooting of part of it, but not, but not all of and it. And what was the idea that you had? The idea was just to do a thing where he's leaving, he's coming from New York. He took him back to New Jersey. Back to New Jersey. Um, comes through the Lincoln, it was, start, was to start out in the Lincoln Tunnel, just right. as you're getting toward the, to the sunlight, where, the, where right. the sunlight opens up, and you're driving out of the tunnel, and then taking him all the way back through his neighborhood into, uh, into to, the to home. His home. Yeah, and it's very effective. Well, thank you. And, and how about the song? Who wrote the song? How'd the that song happen? is a band called A3 from England, mm -hmm. um, which I had heard on uh, this great show out in LA, Morning Becomes Eclectic on KCRW, mm -hmm. and they play a lot of really good music. And I had heard that song two or three years before. Oh, it's really? It wasn't written for the show? No, no, no. Oh, I'd heard wow. it two years before. In fact, we auditioned a lot of, we, we shot that sequence and then threw up a whole bunch of songs yeah. against it. Uh, we used a Kinks song, we tried an Elvis Costello song, all of which were great. Uh, Stevie Van Zandt song, and this one just seemed to capture it. Yeah, best. it's funny how they kind of stick when the, they stick yeah, together. Yeah, it, it was no doubt about it. Yeah. And I, in fact, for a while, I wanted to do a different song every week. Uh -huh. And HBO said, don't do that, give us something identifiable. And yeah. I thought, oh, how bourgeois, you know, how stupid. <laughs> but then I heard this song, and I thought, yeah, this is great. Yeah, it works. Um, well, going to the, the pilot episode, which I thought was brilliant, um, the image of the ducks in the pool is a very haunting one, and um, it turns out to be rather a memorable metaphor. H how did that idea come about, the whole idea of the ducks? Well, I had a, long before the HBO life of the show, it was, uh, it was originally it was a Fox project, it was a Fox development project, and I was going to, I had to write a pilot script for Fox, and at that time, at that time there was also a deal to bring back the Rockford Files on CBS in these two-hour movies. And uh, <clears throat> people doing that were Steve, Stephen Cannell and myself and Juanita Bartlett. We'd all worked on the Rockford Files together. So I went over to Juanita's house one day uh, to work on these, for a story conference on this Rockford stuff. And I, I saw in her pool this ramp and these ducks. She said these ducks had come to her house unbidden. And I just thought, ah, that's what we'll do. We'll put those ducks in the show. <laughs> They'll be in Tony's pool. It works marvelously. It's, it, 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 once it was there, it was, it was a chance to, I mean, who knows why these things happen. It was just, I was just, I thought, yeah, he'll have these obsessed with these ducks. It, it works very, it's very moving, actually. It becomes very it touching. To be. And then it, it's referred to th th throughout the first uh, season, really. One of the great things about doing the show was, uh, is, is doing the therapy scenes, in that you can say something. You know, you write a line of dialogue, or you have an idea that happened three, three three episodes ago. Mm -hmm. And then Melfi will ask him, what do you think that meant? So then you, the writer, are forced to think, what did that mean? Because it was only an idea. So you're actually, in a way, forced to psycho psychoanalyze your own ideas. Mm -hmm. So the whole thing about the ducks meant his family leaving him, I didn't realize that when I got the idea about the ducks. I only realized it when she was saying, what do you think those ducks mean? So basically you're saying that the, your instinct. Yeah, that's really, we, uh, we've decided early on just to trust this, uh, you know, all of the writers do, that trust, the sub, trust our subconscious and then try to make sense out of it later rather than design an architecture of mm -hmm. symbols yes, yes. that would, that would you, you know. It might get, it might get precious. Oh, the chocolate bars. Yeah, you know, it might get precious. It. Yeah. Well, it works because it has a freshness. It doesn't seem, you know, Germanic. Stage. And also maybe maybe says something to you about psychotherapy that you can slice slice this stuff a million ways. It doesn't seem <laughs> it it, this. It means yeah, that. yeah. But it doesn't seem to be, you know, schematic. It isn't. And uh, so it, it's it's fascinating. Uh, do did you did you do or do you do a lot of research on uh, psychiatric sessions? I mean, did you do a lot of research for the psychiatric no. sessions? I, uh, I've been in therapy for a long time. So I see, so you had your own. I had done the research. Uh -huh. Lived it's, through the research. It's just finally starting to pay for itself. <laughs> <laughs> what was the original uh, impetus for the series? How did that develop? Uh, the, the original impetus for the series was 
I don't know how far back you want to take this, but I had a deal. To I, the original I, impetus. I had a deal with Brillstein Gray to develop television sh series. I had worked on Northern Exposure and a couple of other shows, many other shows. And so I had a development deal. But you hadn't created a, a series I yet, had created had one series in 1988 that stayed on the air for about six episodes. Uh -huh. What was that called? It was called Almost Grown. And I had some, some similarity to The Sopranos, but... In rate, what way? Uh, the use of uh, pop music and rock and roll. Mm -hmm. That show was all about music. Mm -hmm. And we used a lot of source music, just like we do in this show. But mm -hmm. th that show was about, a couple, was about a, a couple who meet in high school in the early 60s. They go through the famous 60s, all that tribulation. And then they have children of their own. It was the early 80s. By the early 80s, they have ki teenagers of their own. Or by the 80s, and so that so show, it was a family. It was a family thing, but it went back and forth in time. Right. So sometimes you saw those people as <coughs> seniors in high school. Sometimes you saw them going for their draft physical. Sometimes you saw them as parents, and it was. And every episode would go back and forth through all those different eras of their life. It was very difficult to do. I bet. Would you say Almost Grown was the beginning of The Sopranos, or no? That was just the. It was the first show that, that I, you created. That I created, right. but it did have these. They were from New Jersey. This couple, they'd moved to California, and in the use of music, um, and the kind of music, it was it was sort of a kind of a forerunner, just mm -hmm. in that respect. But it was a different. But it was a family drama, actually. Come yeah. to think of it. So go ahead. So then, how did how did so The because, Sopranos? So um, because because I had run some successful shows. And all through my career, really, I started getting development deals. After my work on the Rockford Files, I kept started getting development deals. And I, I, the fact of the matter was, I didn't want to be working in television ever. Um, I want, I wanted your job. <laughs> a direct but, a feature. Directing features, but it never, for whatever reason, it never, it never happened. And early on, I started making money in television, and so I, I went for it. Um, and then. I was always singing the blues. How am I going to get out of this? I want to direct my. I want to make a feature, and so I would use these development deals to write screenplays. Mm -hmm. I none see. of which got produced. So the Brillstein Gray thing was another one of those deals. Mm -hmm. And um, a guy who was working there at that time, Lloyd Braun, gave me this very inspirational speech. And at that time in my life, it was pretty hard to inspire me about television because I was really didn't like it. And he said that he had me over there because they felt that I had a great series inside me. Uh, this is exactly what he said, and I thought, mm hmm. And he meant it. And I, but I, you know, and he said, he said, we don't want to get in your way. All we want to do is help you get it out. And he said, for example, would you like to do a series about The Godfather? This is, this is in the lobby at Bilstein Gray. I said, no, I don't want to do a series about The Godfather, but I do love gangsters. So driving home, I remembered this had been a movie idea. This, the Sopranos had been a, a, a motion picture idea. That you'd had that I'd had, <clears throat> which, which my agents had said, don't bother developing that because it won't sell. And so I'd listened to that. And um, so, but I, so I had this idea in the back of my head, and I thought, I wonder if, we could, if I could make that into a TV series. Mm -hmm. And so that's what happened. And originally, it was a Fox. It was developed for the Fox network. And once the script was written, they passed on it. And what was the, what was the idea? The, 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 the original idea, idea was, the, was well, the relationship the, with the mother and the son? The original story was, yes, the original story was about a guy, a, a gangster, who has a very difficult mother, who is not a typical mob mother. I had read about uh, this mob grandmother in Philadelphia, rather the head of the mob in Philadelphia at that time. Apparently she was quite a contender and a very difficult woman. And so I was interested in doing this mother-son thing, having to do with the son, the gangster, finally has to go get psychotherapy, and because of his problems, because with of his mother. problems with his mother, yeah. gang war is declared. His mother is angry at him for putting her in a home, or for neglecting him. I don't know if I had the home at that point, but she's angry at him for neglecting her. And the the therapist, because she has a window into his mind and is listening to all this stuff about his mother, is the one who says, you know, I think your mother may be the one who's behind this gang war. That was the original idea. I see. Well, I can see how that evolved. And so that's kind of the... That did sort of spread out into the whole right. season. Right. Fascinating. And um, are the characters based on real people you've observed? No. Characters like Christopher or Big Pussy or Uncle Not Jim? at all. I have no, no connection with... I, I don't know anybody in the mob. So how, how did they evolve, these characters? I was just a... Uh, when, I was, you know, I was a, a, when I was growing up in Jersey, I was a, as a young kid, I, I love mob movies. My father and I used to watch The Untouchables. Um, 
every Thursday night. But before that, even as a younger kid, I had seen a Million Dollar Movie. I don't know if you remember Million Dollar Movie. Yeah, sure. They would play the same movie five times a, a week. Right. And they, they played, they had Wellman's Public Enemy. Mm -hmm. And that movie, like, I guess I was probably eight or nine. That was a, a big experience. It was, that movie to me was shocking and frightening. And, mm -hmm. I, and I never sort of lost my fascination for it. So the characters really were not based on anything you knew, but but uh, would you say that uh, they they were inspired by people in your family or people that you observed as you were growing up in New Jersey? There's a, I guess there's, so. There's a sense of I have to say there's a feeling of mm, there's a personal feeling to this. Well, the fa yes, I think the ca the way the characters interact with each other. Let's just take the mob out of it. Yeah. The way the characters interact with each other, and especially the way the family interacts with each other, is definitely based on people that I grew up with. It's based mm -hmm. on my family, except for the cursing. There was no cursing in my family. Mm -hmm. And that the, the fascinating thing about the series is how the family interreacts and how that really dominates, in a funny way, m m dominates the, the gang aspect of it. Well, you know, at that point, when was that, 1997 or something? At, at that point, there was nowhere else to go with a mob movie. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was really, and still, it's who cares about a mob crew in Brooklyn or New Jersey? I mean, you could make that statement. We've seen that and seen that and seen that. Mm -hmm. So the only place to go was into the private life. But that's what's so interesting about it. It turned out that way, and that's why that's why it worked as a television series because TV a TV series is good at that. Yeah, at in family, intimacy, intimacy, intimacy. Yeah. yeah. The first episode, the pilot, packs an enormous amount of information into an hour with a little stretching it could almost be a movie in itself was that your intention to give an audience a great deal no it wasn't my, that wasn't my intention to give them a great deal but at one point i did think if it didn't get bought as a series i thought we could probably shoot and i think it was true i think we could have shot another half hour and released it as a low budget feature. yeah the character of uh, livia uh, is, is it only based on your mother or is it is it also based in any way uh I think I've, we talked about this on, on, on the Livia who was Tiberius's treacherous mother in I, Claudius. I, I know, I mean, I'm, I'm aware I'd, I'd seen that series, not all of it, but I'd seen Tiberius's treacherous mother, Livia. Um, I thought that perhaps this character, Livia, could fulfill a similar function in this story. Mm. You know, the, uh, obviously the Roman-Italian link wasn't lost on me. And yes. Yeah. Maybe in some way, if anything, it was sort of a, a slightly tongue-in-cheek comment on I Claudius. Yes, it, it, it comes. This I Claudius in New Jersey is sort of a you know funny maybe, idea. maybe a funny idea. <laughs> yeah, and we didn't is. do I Claudius in New Jersey, <laughs> but you know that that was that part of it. That reminds me of when uh, when uh, Howard Hawks called Ben Hecht and said he wanted to do a gangster picture, and uh, Ben Hecht said, "You want to do a gangster picture? It's been done." This is 1931. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, Hawks said, yeah, but what we're going to do is we're going to take the Borgias and put them in. Oh, really? And Ben Hecht said, I'll be right out. And that was Scarface. Wow. That became wow. Scarface. The whole incest mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. theme. Anyway, it's funny how... Yeah. The contrast between the normal family life and the abnormal gangster life makes both of them seem strangely universal. Was this part of the intention in the, in the mm -hmm. conception? Yes, it was. I mean, I think I would have tried to make the gangster life strangely universal anyway, even without the family life. But that's the, the interaction is what does it, it seems to me. Mm. It, it seems to make the family life mm, more unusual, even though it's very typical in a way. Right. And it seems to make the, the, the gangster life more typical. That's uh, an interesting point. I never... I never I mean, I've thought things you know like mean? that. Yes, I've thought things like that. I don't. You know what? Possibly, what it, what it is maybe is that we've all seen family dramas, and we I think we we ultimately lose patience with those, with with family dramas because you you get to a point where you say, I think, just fix it, grow up, do something, try you know, be nicer to each other, leave home. If you hate, if it's a, if the marriage is lousy, leave. I think that's what happens in a lot of TV family dramas. Right. But I think when the, the life outside, when there's something larger than that, which is real life and death every day, I think then we have more patience with all that bickering. But maybe that's guessing. so. Uh, so the, the interesting thing is that we live in such a, America is such a violent 
society compared to other societies. Mm -hmm. It has been, it seems to traditionally, a kind of violent society. You know, <coughs> Western gangster pictures sort of took over Westerns. Yeah. But the Western is, is part of American history, mm -hmm. and gangster is part of American history. It, it, and with the Columbine and all the stuff about guns and all this kind of, this kind of uh, violent life that goes on out there all the time. By extension, that's what makes The Sopranos seem to be a, almost a metaphor for American life. Well, my, the, it's interesting you mention that, because when I, you asked me before about the story, the son, the mother, the psychiatrist, that's the story. Once, once I had kind of had this, I guess you could call it a forum dumped in my lap, was, okay, we're going to do a mob story on network TV. The, the, the kernel of the joke, of the essential joke was, Life in America had gotten so savage, selfish, basically selfish, that even a mob guy couldn't take it anymore. That was the essential joke. And he's in therapy because yeah. what he sees <laughs> upsets him so much, what he sees every day. And that, that, that he and his guys were the ones who invented selfishness. They invented me first. Mm -hmm. They invented, it's all about me. Mm -hmm. And now he can't take it because it's, it's, the rest of the country has surpassed them. Wow. That was the original well, joke. That's, that's a big point. When you say joke, you mean in show business terms. No, it was the original yeah, I know what you sort mean. of joke of the, the overall of the, absurd of the, joke of, yeah. the, of the show. But did you see this show as a, as a kind of comedy drama? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because that's... I guess so. I mean, I don't think I've ever written anything different. I mean, I don't really believe in my career. I, I, I just see, th I try to write the way things are. And things are funny. And usually and they're, yeah. I don't, tr I don't try to blend the two. It's just the way it is. But it's the best thing about the show, I think, is this kind of outrageous comedy. At this point in time, it's really a little bit hard to take mobsters seriously. That all that seriously. <clears throat> I mean, when, you go, when I go back and look at The Godfather, in fact, I have a th now that I've gone back many times to look at The Godfather, I have a theory about that, which is that they were depressed. I think Don Corleone was depressed, <laughs> and I think Michael was depressed. And if you watch it, those are two depressed guys. They're walking around like this all the time. <laughs> and they needed, th they needed really, analysis. Really, they already needed therapy, <laughs> and they never got it. <laughs> did you write the first two episodes? Um, did you write the first two episodes as a feature-length movie? Be no. Because they could be, in a way. No, no, we, no. We, uh, I wrote the pilot. We shot the pilot. I then there was about six, course. you know, six months of when HBO decided whether or not to do it. And then once they decided to do it, we had to come up with twelve more hours. And so HBO paid for the pilot. Right. They, 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 you wrote the script on spec, or no? I wrote the script. Actually, Fox originally Fox. paid for the pilot. Same. This. Oh, really? Yeah. They they re. Brillstein Gray is the, that's the way it works in TV. Brillstein Gray is a development company. Brillstein Gray paid me a salary to do this pilot. Fox, I wrote it for Fox. Mm -hmm. Fox reimbursed them for the price of a pilot, mm -hmm. so that then offsets my salary or anybody on a development right, deal. Right. And the script existed. And now I don't know whether Fox had to be paid off once HBO decided to take it on, or whether they had so lost Fox, their. Uh, Fox passed, and on the they said, "I'm not going to do. We're not going to do the pilot. We're not going to shoot a pilot." Right, we're not going to shoot it. And so then Brillstein Gray took it elsewhere. And they took it to, I think, all the networks, actually, and they all passed. Well, it was fortuitous, wasn't it? Tremendously. Because uh, I think one of the, we've talked about this, but one of the things that I think makes the show so effective is that there are no interruptions, <clears throat> which gives it the feeling of a movie. Uh, you're not, you know, it doesn't seem like a television show mm -hmm. at all on mm -hmm. any level because what, what's associated with television is commercial interruptions. The fact that there aren't any, and it's so intense, uh, there's this sense of suspense in every show. But you know, it's interesting because you say it's intense, but it's very slow moving. It doesn't seem to be. But it, it, if you think about it, it is very, very slow moving, much more than a television show. Television shows are... But that's one of the things that is uh, interesting, because that's one of the things that I think makes it work so well, is that there is an built-in sense of suspense to the show. I, I've sat there and I've watched these, uh, all of them, in a short amount of time recently. And uh, I get this feeling of, of tension in each episode, builds and builds and builds. And, this, and uh, one of the things uh, you know as well as I do, write, better than I do, uh, writing a television episode 
you write seven acts because you're going to have seven inter commercial interruptions. In two hours. In, in two hours. Yeah. Which means that you're constantly building to a climax because you got to go to a climax in order to go to a right. commercial. Right, hour show it's four, yeah, four acts. All right, so four acts. That means that you would have to go to four climaxes because, generally speaking, before you go to a commercial, you want to give them a cliffhanger. You don't do that in in this show. Well, even I think in network television, you can just when you cut to the commercial, that's somehow now it's gotten to the fact that makes it a cliffhanger. You can go out on the guy drinking a cup of coffee. You go to the commercial, you think, gee, that. That must have been significant. Yes, right. <laughs> a sip of coffee. <laughs> yeah. But wasn't there, isn't there a... The, you know, those rhythms just become built into people. Sure, but isn't there a kind of unspoken, you know, as you're writing a, 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 a show that's going to be interrupted, there, there has to be some sense of, you know, we're going to go to a commercial here. Uh, yeah, that you sort of, you know, you, as a writer, you, you, you think about that. Mm -hmm. Whereas in this, what I think is so effective is that you don't get that feeling of being manipulated into a certain climax. Well, I, I guess that it was I guess that was operating, but for me, that wasn't the main difference. The main difference was, gee, I could, we can tell these stories at a different pace. We can have them build slowly, for one thing. We can have them build really quickly. The other thing was we don't have to explain everything, like in a network. They, you know, it's, it really is the old Hollywood adage, tell them what they're going to see, show it to them, and then just tell them what they just they saw. Just saw right. We don't do that anymore, right. as I really took that... I really took that that to heart. That's a big and deal. Also, I felt that, you know, the movies I like best are movies where. Well, you notice I said movies, not television shows, because I don't think this happens. Something happens in Act One. Someone says something, and then you see a pattern of this recurring. Someone says something either either you see the guy contradict what he said, or you know how there's that you need to bring stuff. It's active watching or something. You need to you need to bring every little piece of information you're given to the watching of the entire thing, especially with European movies, mm -hmm. that's really mm -hmm. essential, mm -hmm. you know? But I feel that in this series. That's what I, that's what I thought, well, boy, it'll be great to do that. But you do it'll it. It'll be fun for us to do that. You do that, and it's wonderful, because there are things that are not paid off for several episodes. Uh, there, there's things that you pay off in the last, the 13th episode. The ducks are paid off again. In fact, you bring them back in a funny way. Uh, and you connect that, and then there's things that pay off in the 13th episode that w w that you know really connects the whole 13 hours. But even within the hour, I feel that that's true. It I, is I, true. I feel that that's true. That it, that it to me is that those, that's always been my favorite kind of movie since I became you know adult or something. Mm -hmm. You know, or my, since I was a, my late teens. Yes. I've always liked that kind of thing where little clues are given to you. I don't mean like a corny detective. No, no, movie. I know what you I mean. mean. I know what you mean. It's 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 human things. It's human things, and it, and that in the end, it's still a puzzle, even though it's over. You're still going, gee, I wonder what they, wonder yeah. why that character behaved like that. Yes. Well, that you get a lot of that in this in this series, which is unusual on American television. It's a beginning. It's unusual in American movies by now. I, I think it is. Yeah. Yeah. How do you plan out? How do you plan out a season of shows? How do you do that? The you first two seasons were very the. Um, the only planning we had was the pr plot that I told you, the mother, the son, the psychiatrist, and, and originally the mother was going to die. He was going to, I suppose, he was going to... Kill her. No, at first he was going to kill her. Then, once he found out, he was going to go over to confront her about it and to kill her, but she was already going to be dead, so he would never have his cathartic moment. Mm -hmm. Then Nancy Marchand turned out to be as great as she was. It became a television series, and there was absolutely no appetite to kill her right, right. because we wanted to keep her going. Mm -hmm. So he did get cheated because she had the stroke and she can't tell whether she was listening to him or hearing him or anything. That's a great scene. Um, and that's how that got changed. But so you, you, what is the, take me through the process if you don't mind a little bit. I mean, you sit around with the, with your writers or with the executive producers? No, the, how pro do you, the process how do you do is, is that, I mean, I had this, mo I had this bones of this movie plot, which I told you about, which never became a movie, became this TV show. So I stretched that over, out over 13 episodes. Mm -hmm. So once HBO decided to buy it, of course I panicked and thought, oh my God, now we have to do a series. So I, I just made little benchmarks, like this might happen here or there. This is when he find, this is when Uncle Junior and, and Livia get together on this plot. Uh, there's an attempt on Tony's life, which is foiled. It was very, very vague and mm -hmm. not not Bible-like at all, as, mm -hmm. as they call it in television. Mm -hmm. There was a few other plot lines. Um, 
but they were very, very vague. The second season... You say there was a few other plot lines that you had thought of before you sat I, down I, I, I made 13 lines on a board. I see. And I thought, okay, here, like, I think it actually turned out that way. Episode, episode four, Junior becomes the boss. Episode five, Tony undercuts Junior. And you jump ahead. Episode eight, Junior gets angry at Tony. Uh, episode 11, Junior and Livia decide he should go. It, but really, that's all. Mm -hmm. And then there was, I don't remember what other plot lines we had that year, but. And how does that get fleshed out then? We have that as a spine. Right. I mean, the way I look at it is, is that if you look at a Christmas tree, people don't care about the trunk of the Christmas tree. They only care about the lights and the balls and the tinsel. But the, but the trunk has to be there. Otherwise so we always referred back to that. Mm -hmm. And it really came in because we always, so we had this continuing story, which people seemed to get involved in. Mm -hmm. I didn't intend to do a soap opera. I never wanted to do a TV soap opera, but mm -hmm. it kind of started to fall into that a little bit in that... People were in suspense. What's going to happen to Pussy? What happened? We're, I, at the end of the first season, people were saying, where's Pussy? Where did he go? I had no idea anybody was going to care. We didn't think that was a big thing. He was mm -hmm. gone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then it became this, they, they called that a cliffhanger. Yeah, sure. The press and everybody said, oh, this incredible cliffhanger where you don't know where Pussy is. Part of this was just sloppy storytelling. How much of the incidents is, are based on actual events? Well, I mean, you know, for instance, a lot of the gangster stuff. A lot of the gangster stuff, um, mostly things I read, situations that I read about. There are some things that happened in my hometown. Again, this is about season two. The characters of, not season one, the characters of Matt and Sean, the two kids who do the hit on spec. Yes. That happened in my hometown. Mm -hmm. um, Frank Renzulli, who one, one of the writers and yeah. crews on the show, grew up in North Boston and uh, was really a neighborhood kid. And so he was very... He contributed a lot of a lot of that marinara sauce. He uh, he knew about how how like a boss can tax somebody. He knew about sort of the financial pyramid that makes up a mob that makes up mob life. The actual business of it. He did know that. Well, this leads me to that question. Now, when you're planning out the season, and you've got this spine that you you mentioned. And you've got, like, say, Frank Ranzulli and whoever else you're s bouncing ideas off of. Don't you sit? You sit in a kind of a story oh, right, conference. Right. So, yeah, we were talking about that. That um, so I have this very vague 13 episode so-called arc. Right. And um, then we start to plot out stories which would just be interesting. In another, the what what I wanted to do was make a little movie every week, mm -hmm. even though these things are connected by their 13 little movies. Mm -hmm. So every I wanted everyone to be like a movie. Mm -hmm. You sure, you sure did succeed. Well, great, because that's what, that's what we really tried hard to do. Um, and in fact, there was a little bit of friction the first season between myself and HBO because they were more interested in the serialized elements, and I was not. Mm -hmm. well, how, what do you mean? Give me an example. Well, well what's going to happen from one episode to the next? I see. You know, they were into the, they got interested in the so, sort of the more soap. I don't know, I'm not using that pejoratively. Right. In, in what we would call the serialized elements or the soap elements. Uh, are they going to kill Tony or not? Or who planned it? Mm -hmm. Or right. what's the result of what happened in episode two? I didn't. I wanted. I was more interested in discrete little movies. Mm -hmm. So it was a, finding a balance of that. You but were it, more interested in the characters. Essentially. No, no. I want. Well, how can I explain it? For me, the most successful episode of the show is is the one called College. The one where he takes his daughter. Yes. Okay. And, that's a and recognizes right. a, a squealer. To me, that's that's a film noir in and of itself. Mm -hmm. That could have been a low-budget movie from yes. the 40s or something yes. like that. It has nothing to do with anything that happened beforehand. It has nothing to do with anything that happened later. Right. It's two very discreet stories. A, guy, a gangster takes his daughter to college, has to kill a rat while his wife almost sleeps with a priest. Yes. You could make that movie, right? Yes. Nobody would go to see it, because, <laughs> but you could make that movie. Um, to me, that was, that was the ultimate Soprano episode. Mm -hmm. And that has nothing to do with anything that came before or after. Mm -hmm. So at any rate, so we once we have these 13 episodes up, then we just try to do what would be a really interesting show and plot out episode two, and then plot out, or movie number two, movie number three. And little by some we do go back and salt in some of these. Sometimes it's just a word that referred back to something that happened last time. or mm -hmm. Just do the connective tissue last. Last. That's the last thing you do. And... 
so the entire season is prepared before anybody sits down and starts to write episode two, three, four, five. It's prepared. And in other words, it's no. it's thought. It, you've got you've figured out. No. No. We we have those thir that those that thing on the board was just these this, thirteen this, lines right. with very little stuff, mm -hmm. and then we have f like five writers on the show. So we sit down and we all together come up with five storylines. Actually, beat it out every scene. Mm -hmm. Do the structure for each for each little movie, mm -hmm. and then one of the writers takes that outline, goes away, and writes a screenplay, mm -hmm. and we try to get them launched like one a week. Mm -hmm. So by the end of five weeks, everybody's sitting down, everybody's off writing a teleplay. I see, and you but you haven't got the thirteenth one yet. No. It's the first five. And then the first five oh, come in, and we get preoccupied with that and making them good. Oh, and at the same time, we're then trying to get like six, six, seven, and eight launched. I see. And under With the same, the same like, writers. Under the same writers. And, try, and so it, it's done sort of in blocks, in a way. I see. So you don't have the entire thing right from the no, beginning. Only just, that, just the spine. Just that spine. Yeah, that's fascinating. And then you flesh it out as you go along. Uh, right. Uh, the mm -hmm. first five, th that those scripts come in, you start, you start rewriting. We start rewriting and getting those ready to shoot. Right. And don't, and really, know, don't really know what's going to happen at the end. I didn't know, I didn't know that Livia wasn't going to die until... Probably, well, the end of the season. <laughs> well, you wrote the last episode. Yeah, and I think we, I think by, when we started writing, I thought we were still thinking, well, should she die or not? And we were saying, no, she's such a great character. Let's just. And she her, was bring brilliant. Her back. Yeah, Nancy. Um, I noticed there's very little scoring in the series. None. Yeah, just source music. Mm. How was that decided? And I just like that. I mean, I, I just like that kind of. I've always, you know, Scorsese's always done that, and and um, so is Woody Allen actually. Different kind of music, but and Kubrick. I, I find that the movies that I really like don't have score. I don't. I don't Hitchcock started it in Rear Window. Right. Uh, actually. Was that re really? Yeah, I think he was the first. It was the first. That picture had no score. But speaking of Public Enemy. I went back well, there's and really saw no it. score in that, is there? I don't know if there is. I don't remember if there's score or not. But at, at the end, you know, they, "I'm Forever Blowing Bubbles" is the theme song for the mm -hmm. movie. At the end, when they're going to bring Cagney home, they say, "Oh, they're bringing Tommy home from the hospital." And she says, "Oh, I'll go upstairs and get his room ready." And so the people go about their business. You see a hand put a put the arm on a Victrola. Is what they were called then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Right. So it's source music. It's playing in the house. Right. When they deliver him, and he collapses and he falls forward into the camera, and his mother's up. That's very. That's a long time ago. Right, right. Well, there, the scores were not used as much in the '30s. Oh, really? Uh, at all? I guess now that I think about it, yeah, you're right. There just wasn't that much of it, particularly in the early '30s, because they did, hadn't figured out a way to put music mm -hmm. in afterward mm -hmm. uh, yet. Um, that's right. Yeah. So they they didn't. St so scores didn't become as as predominant uh, until the, into the '40s, mm. late '30s, mm -hmm. into the '40s. Uh, actually, I started the song score with with uh, with targets and with picture show because we I didn't want to have a score mm -hmm. uh, and uh, an extensive. Well, that's right. You had a lot of Hank Williams. We had all yeah. that on the picture show. See, that's the show. stuff I really. Yeah. yeah and well, that, you know, and those movies were very, those movies were very influential. Well, it was uh, it was interesting because I, when we did targets, I didn't have any money for a score, and. Uh, Roger Corman wasn't going to pay for a sc score, and we had no money at all. So I uh, had a friend of mine who'd produced some records, and I said, can I use any of your records? And he said, well, for 5,000, I'll give you these six records. So, mm -hmm. I, so I ended up, what could I do? I couldn't use them as score. I could only use them on the radio. Right. So I used little bits and pieces great. of lousy That's music, great. too, just whenever mm -hmm. the radio was on. And I noticed in doing it that it gives a sense of reality that is beyond whatever you've done right, because it doesn't seem like a movie. Mm -hmm. So when I noticed it in The Sopranos, I thought again it works extremely well. And of well. course, you at that time you were tied into the six songs you had. If you have, if you ha as you know, if you have, if you can get any song you want, right? Not only does it have reality, but can also comment on the action. It can actually score it. So, right. You know. Yes. Yes. Well, that's what we did on Picture Show. We. we that's we, right. We, I forgot that. That was terrific. The, yeah, that was just the era I was coming up, so that's why that's why, this is that's where I got all that was from. We had like twenty eight records in mm -hmm. that picture, and that score co that song score cost seventy five thousand dollars. If we did it today, oh yeah, you can, 
Yeah, now it's not the cheap way to go at all. No, it's it's because everybody <laughs> started doing it. You know. Um, well, now TV commercials are using. You know, I know. The Stones and everybody. But I think it's it's again it, it's one of the things that gives the the series such as feeling of rea realism is that that the that the music doesn't there isn't music coming in to comment. That was really important. It was important to me to have source music. And from the beginning, I said, uh, listen, I really want to make sure we have a decent source music budget, mm -hmm. music licensing budget. Mm -hmm. And people would say to me, why? And I could never really answer it, to tell you the truth. I just wanted it. Well, it's realistic. I guess. It gives a sense of realism. Uh, I ended up doing that in, in my first picture by having something always going on in the background television was on so you'd hear not mm -hmm. necessarily music right. but you'd hear a show right. or something under low mm -hmm. but, but it gives you a feeling that you're mm -hmm. there life life as opposed to a score coming in and telling you what to feel uh, the interior um, by the way the music is brilliantly oh, done, done in the show Thank you. Just they gave us they came through with the money and they gave us enough money to do it right I love the way you ended the first the pilot with that. I don't know who, who sings that song. When Nick the, Lowe. The Beast, the within, beast in Me. Really yeah, it's powerful. Lowe, yeah. It's actually a song about alcoholism. But it, wow. It, it well, worked. you can interpret it that way. Yeah. But, uh, it yeah, worked. it's a great, it it's a great song. Yeah. Johnny Cash did a version of that song. Really? Which is very, very good. Yeah. The interior struggles of the families. Um, oh, I've already asked you this, really. They're based on things that you really experienced or you knew about. The Kristen, the Christopher Brendan versus Uncle Junior, that's, that sort of thing, for example. That was kind of made up. That was concocted. But it is the kind of thing that, I guess, goes on. Well, you know, in reading, we had heard, we in researching, we knew that the, the generation, or we'd heard that the generation of wise guys coming up were not the same as the older generations, that, that the younger ones were, drugs played a great, greater part of their lives than they did with the older guys, naturally, and that the whole idea of respect and honor was not quite what it had been, just like it is in the rest of America. Drugs were not were not originally a, a mob thing. Is that because there's some? Well, they've said that. I've never known whether it was true. I, I think that there were some guys. From what I can understand now, there were some mob. Some of the New York families paid lip service and to the no drug policy, and sold it anyway. Some said, "Screw that. We're going to sell it. It's too profitable," and some said, "I don't want any part of it." Why do you think that there's a general feeling that they didn't want a part of it? Is it because it has such a bad connotation? I think, I think this, well, I, I don't know, but I'll tell you what, hap what happened, as it was explained to me by people who, who knew. In a way, it was drugs that, brought, that caused the mob a lot of their problems mm -hmm. in the 70s and 80s because the, that's when the code of silence fell apart. Because in the old days, you could do, if you were arrested, if you were a career wise guy, and you got arrested for larceny or hijacking a truck, and you had to do five years in prison. As horrible as that may sound to you or me, five or seven, those guys could do that. Mm -hmm. When you get arrested for trafficking cocaine, that's 30 to life. Yeah. Nobody can do that. So that's when they started ratting each other out. Wow. And that's when, the, that's when the code of silence fell, fell apart. apart. That's what we have in one of the scenes. I think there's a guy that explains it on TV. Yes. A television Yes, television. right. So drugs, you know, drugs were not good for America. Drugs were not good for the mob either. So, so what's good for America is good for the mob, <laughs> and vice versa. I guess. The reality of the children in the series, the uh, the scoring, the drugs again. Reality, the finding of, the the finding out of the children about the father's real occupation. That that's a big thing in 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 in, the, in the, a couple it is. of the episodes. It is, yeah. How did that come about? Just you know, you begin to think what it would. You just put yourself in their shoes. What would it be like? And they are at that age where. They'd be curious. They'd be curious. Well, they're also, you know, the teenage years are also years years when you really don't care anything about your parents. Mm -hmm. So you're curious, but in the end, don't care. Mm -hmm. The kids are wonderfully done. Oh, those two kids are great. Yeah, but they're wonderfully written, and the actors are superb. Well, I think everybody who works on the show, the actors are, are they are just, they're very unadorned. They don't really, they never try to be cute. No. no. Or funny. No. Um, and I think all the, the well, those of us on the show believe that, by and large, kids are not. Is, is strangely enough, since there's so many teenage shows and kid shows and so much concentration put on high school, that a lot of it is not at all true to life. 
Yeah. And they and a lot of so much so many movies now deal with empowered kids. They they drive before they're supposed to, and and they they always have an answer for everything, and they're totally in control of what they say, and they don't seem to experience any um, uh, self consciousness or and they're always empowered. I mean, right. I've noticed in movies like you see very often you do a teenage movie, you see the kid sort of victorious, going like yeah, meaning. He triumphed over the bullies, or he triumphed over his parents. Right, and that's not my recollection of teenage being a teenager that you triumph over anything. Just the opposite. Yeah, <laughs> which is how the show goes. Yeah, I mean they're confused people. You know, they're yeah. just they're trying to figure it out. And they're and what's extraordinary is that they're confused kids in a very confused situation. Right. I mean, often I've thought watching this, what a life! I mean, mm -hmm. this constant terror lurking yeah. in the background. And who really knows if that's right? See, we have no way of knowing. Mm -hmm. Actually, I was told, uh, a friend of mine told me that I went to high school with, uh, that I had forgotten this. I went to high school with the son of a wise guy from New Jersey, but I'd forgotten. Yeah. And I have yet, I wanted to call him up and say, are we getting that right? You uh, haven't. But I haven't, no. Well, I'm sure you are. It's, it's, it feels so real. Um, the brutality of the murder is the death in the bathtub, the strangling of the squealer by Tony in contrast to their family behavior. That, is that part of the impact of the series, you think? I think it's important. I know that everybody, everybody loves the Soprano family, and we love Tony Soprano, and um, what a great guy, and he's so funny, and they're all so funny. I think it's important always, to re because it is based, at least we hope, we try to be based on reality, to r never forget what the reality is. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, well, there's two things. Number one, I don't think real wise guys commit as many murders as any mob movie shows. But they will go that extra distance. Mm -hmm. And they do intimidate, brutalize, and murder people. So I think it's important to have that be part of the texture because so we, we don't sort of go merrily off this pier that, oh, these lovable, funny mafia guys. Well, that, that's what I think is so powerful. One of the things that's so powerful, you, you constantly keep reminding the audience of the of the extraordinary brutality that that lurks underneath the surface of the of this of this of these lives. Well, but you know, I mean, Goodfellas was a very important movie to me, mm -hmm. and uh, Goodfellas really plowed that. I found that movie very funny, mm -hmm. and brutal, mm -hmm. and it felt very real. Mm -hmm. And yet, it was the first. I think it, that was the mob. Of course, all of his work has been like that, but that was the first time he actually dealt with a mob crew. Mm -hmm. As opposed to say the Godfather, in which there, there, there's something operatic about it and yes. classical, even the clothing and the cars, and you know, I mean, I always think about Goodfellas when they go to the mother's house that night and they're eating, and you know, and she brings out her painting. That stuff is great. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Sopranos has only has learned learned a lot from that. Mm -hmm. How did you just, how do you decide on the directors and the writers? How did that how did that how does that work out? Uh, the writers, um, I I. Robin and Mitch, I had worked with before on Northern Exposure, and you brought them in right from the, when you when you when you, after the when pilot. it got greenlit after the pilot. Yeah, mm -hmm. they they had read the script and they really liked it, and I and I I knew what they could do because I'd worked with them before. Um, the others, I read material, and Frank's just jumped off the page. He's like I say, he's he was a writer, and you read something he'd written. Yeah, I read. He had I think he'd worked for David Kelly, and he'd also had a, I think he had had a couple of short-lived series. So you here. brought him on. Yeah, brought him on, and then. We did some experimenting. Some of the people we started with aren't with us anymore. Mm -hmm. They sort of fell away kind of fast. And what, same thing with the directors? Where you mm, directors. bring somebody in and... Usually we try to be people. Well, the first year, it was... I'm was talking about the first year. A combination of people we knew, people I knew, or some of us knew, and who was in New York, because we were trying to save money and not bring people from right, L.A. Right, and Most of my connections with directors were in... It seems LA. John Patterson and Alan Coulter... Uh, have continued with you, right? Well, Alan was one of the was one of the New York, that was the New York contingent, mm -hmm. and uh, Alan came to see me early on and said he really wanted to do the show, and um, and he's a producer too on the show. He did become a producer on the show, mm -hmm. and and uh, he's done some of our best work. Mm -hmm. John Patterson, I go back to Stanford Film School with. He was when I got to Stanford Film School, he was already there. He was like the TA over me when we first got there. He, I, he directed me in one of the episodes. He's right. really good. I yeah, he's very good. He really knows his stuff. He's yeah. been directing a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Tim Van Patten, you, you 
brought he was him a, in. John was a New York, was a California guy who I wanted to work with. So you brought him in. Brought him in. Tim was also a guy from New York here that I want that we hit, we were trying like I say we were trying to try to bring people from yeah. New York because save some money. And he did a good and job. And it's turned out to be it, now we don't really think that much about the money aspect of it. Yeah. But which it's but he's, we just we you just used him on the second yeah, series. Yeah. Uh, how about the casting of all the actors? It's so so right on the money. Um, uh, how, how, how did you, how did that how did you cast the how, how was the casting accomplished? Just, Just a typical people? way. We have, I mean, the, the the best thing we did was um, I saw a movie that Steve Buscemi directed called Trees Lounge. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever seen. I didn't see. I heard it's it. Very good. Yeah, I heard it was. And I loved the way I loved the cast in that movie. And I looked at the casting. And it said George Ann Walken and Sheila Jaffe. They were the, and I didn't know either one of them. Mm -hmm. And I said, that's the people we should get to cast the show. And I don't think they'd ever cast a series before. Mm -hmm. They'd cast mostly independent movies. So that was the best thing we did. And they they ha brought us, you know, they brought us these great New York actors. Right. They brought them in. And but that was that part of your intention was to use New York actors yes. to keep it East Coast. It definitely was to keep it East Coast because in its in, in its Fox incarnation, um, people said to me, "Oh, I see. It's set in New Jersey, so you'll shoot the pilot. You'll shoot part of the pilot. You'll shoot the exteriors of the pilot in Jersey." And then shoot the interiors in L.A. And then shoot the series in L.A. And I said, no, no, I'm going to shoot the whole thing in Jersey. And people go, and you could tell they were looking at you like, yeah, that's interesting, you simpleton. That's never going to happen. <laughs> and really, that was that that kind of like you right. poor schmuck. It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. You know that kind of cynical. Oh, really? And then, <laughs> uh, and if so, their or their second position would be, oh, I see. You'll shoot the series in L.A., but you'll send a unit back to grab the exteriors to New York not Jersey to New York every once in a while to get some exteriors and I said no no we want to shoot the whole thing in Jersey <laughs> and you could see people lose interest it was it was a negative you could see yeah. production companies lose interest once they heard this yeah. even though they would have exerted their will and said no you can't do that it was a disincentive to getting another disincentive to getting involved when I went to HBO Chris Albrecht said now you're gonna really shoot this in New Jersey right it says Jersey you're gonna get Jersey I said oh. yeah well, that's a whole so that was a whole different you yeah. know that's a bet. One thing like that makes mm -hmm. a huge difference. Did the uh, some of the casting influence the characters? Uh, for example, oh, absolutely. Like Tony Sirico or uh, or um, Stevie Van Zandt. Most specifically, I would say yes, they did. Jim um, influenced the character of Tony Soprano, and I remember, I remember exactly when it was. Um, the first day of shooting, we shot the last scene of the pilot. And in the last scene of the pilot, um, they're having a barbecue. And Chris goes off to sulk by himself. Right. Because he didn't get any credit for killing the guy by, over the garbage contract. So he's out and he's, he's moping. And, he, and Tony goes over and says, what's the matter with you? And they get into a conversation and Chris says to him, you know, I don't, I don't want to stick around for this stuff. I, my cousin goes out with this D girl in Hollywood and she says that I could sell my life story for millions. And in the script it says, Tony goes like, like a wake up thing, like, what's the matter with you? What are you talking about? Jim said to me, I think I get really angry about that, don't you? I mean, I think I like grab him and just about smash his head. And I thought, I said, yeah, yeah, you would, you're right. And when he did it, I saw Tony Soprano. I, that's what I mean. It was enough, I needed to be reminded that this was not a cuddly guy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That he has that aspect to him, but he also would kill you. And Jim, through his actor process, showed me that. That's fascinating. Uh, and w did that happen? And we, I think we left the network behind that day. In a way, that's when we left network television behind, some in some crucial way. And that right was, then. And you said that was shot early on. Early on, yeah. Yeah. Because in network television, we would have been doing so much more to like keep his skirts clean. You keep him. Pet the dog. Uh, Help Tony, you know, help Paulie Walnut's mother get an eye operation. We would have been doing all this, you know. Right. Feeding, maybe he has a friend who is a cop and he feeds him information about the really bad, bad, bad. You know, it went away. Would, would you say that any of the other actors brought that, all the, all the other actors bring that same kind of... Uh... They, they do. Mm -hmm. They do, and that's the, that's the nice thing about it being a TV show is because the more you... You, you do episode one, and you do two, three, four. You start to see things in these actors, and they start to suggest things. I don't mean that they come to you and say, I think I should have a, a Labrador Retriever. Right. Their performance begins to touch off ideas in you, and it grows. 
Can you give me another example? Drea Di Matteo. Yeah. Okay, plays Adriana. In the pilot, if you notice, she's her line is, "Your table will be ready in a second, sir." Right. Right. But we saw her. There was something about her. So when we tried to create a girlfriend for Chris, we said, "Let's get that woman, that young woman who was in the the restaurant hostess." She came in. Boom. So we hired her. She did. I think she first appears in the. Meadowlands episode when she goes to pick him up and he's crapped in his pants because he was so scared. Right. And that scene, I mean, she was so good that we started to build stuff around her. Yeah, she and she good. became a character. And their, their storyline, their romance, became uh, one of the central threads of the show. Yeah, and it's, it's very powerful in the second season. And I think if it had, you know, if it hadn't, <clears throat> if it had been a different actress, that may, we may not have gone that direction. Right. We would have mm. concentrated on Christopher as a as a baby, baby wise guy, and that's all. Not as somebody with a girlfriend. So you, you, you believe in uh, John Ford's axiom that the best things happen by accident, or you look for the happy accident. I, I'm, I I'm really asking do. you. Yeah, I really do. Yeah. When I, you know, I haven't directed that much, and it, and I, I shied away. I've always wanted to, but I shied away from it for a long time because I thought you had to be somebody who would scream at people and be completely rigid. Now, now that you're mentioning John Ford, this comes as a revelation to me because. I would think that John Ford ruled with an iron hand. And I thought that's what you have to be, is like John Ford, and people have to be terrified of you. But then after I did it, I finally got the nerve to do it once. The first time out, I noticed that you had to be, it's, it's also about being open. So, that, I mean, you know all this, but this was a big, this was news to me. <laughs> that you're well, constantly being, that there's a lot of intake going on, and you have to take that stuff in and use it. And I didn't know that. I thought it was von Stroheim with the riding, riding cry. I did, you know. <laughs> what are you saying? Shoot it now, you know. That's you know that, that is the cliche that we all kind of think about. I remember when Ford said that to me, though, when I asked him about some scene in a picture, and he said, oh, it was just an accident. I mean, most of the good things in pictures happen by accident. And I thought, what? Do you believe, do you believe this? Yeah, I do now. And I, I went, and I went to Orson Welles, who was a big fan of Ford's, and I said, you know what Ford said? And Orson, I said, is that true? And Orson looked at me and says, yes. I would even say <laughs> that a director is a man who presides over accidents. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, what you're saying to me is a lot of things happen, and the trick is to go with it. If, if it don't you believe, I mean, don't you believe, maybe you don't believe this, I think that the director could stand there and never, for one thing, never open his mouth, and the movie's going to get finished. The crew is going to finish that movie. That's true. <laughs> They're going to go on. That's They're going to keep shooting, whether That's you true. open your mouth or not. Basically. Now, it could be terrible because no one guided it. But right, but it'll get done. It'll get done. Yeah, that's Orson used to say that, that, that the director's job was highly overrated. And I said, how can you say that? He said, well, I can say it because it's true. He says, you know, there's somebody on the set who can do everything. They don't, he doesn't have to be there. Right. <laughs> and, and I said, but, 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 you know, I'd say, but, but Howard Hawks, well, he says, you're talking about great directors. Mm -hmm. He said, that's a different story. He said, but the average director is, is uh, the most useless person no, on the it's, set. No, it's, it's really true, but, I, I, and I, of course, you, there are great directors, and those people are irreplaceable, and, it may, and that makes all the difference. I mean, you can drink a bottle of wine, or you can have a really great wine. That's right. what we're talking about. Right. But I thought that the, there'd never be wine in the bottle unless the director was there. But clearly, because the, the crew and the, cat, the crew they is really answering to, to the clock. We've right. got to shoot this by 10 o'clock. That's right. all. Yeah. And so. the actors know what to do, and there's <laughs> right. a script, and so on. Yeah. Uh, so you've answered the question, basically. The actors, you, you often let the, act, like, let the actors influence the, the writing of the yeah. characters. We don't really go for a lot of improvisation. No, I don't mean that. But, but something about the actor's personality. So, so there's a kind of a melding of the character yeah. and the actor. That's the fun of it. Well, that's, I think, the best kind of movie acting, is when you just can't tell the difference between who that actor is and what that character is, which is what you've achieved, I think, brilliantly. I mean, I'll tell you a story that has nothing to do with this show. When I was, what, I, I worked on Northern Exposure in the second, the last two seasons. There was an extra a guy named Moultrie Patton, an old man. And I think the year before I'd gotten there, they, he, and he lived in Oregon, and the show was shot in Seattle. 
he would drive up for, to work as an extra. And I think the year before I got there, they'd given him a line, like by necessity. Take a left-hand turn up here. He had this great quality. So myself and the other producers began giving him a few more lines. Pretty soon he became the, the, the boyfriend of, Ru of Ruth Ann, mm -hmm. one of the principals in the show. This extra who had done a Turns out Moultrie Patton had been an actor on Broadway in the 30s, had given it all up because he never succeeded. Came back to Oregon, was living in Oregon, doing I don't know what, becomes an extra on Northern Exposure. And then by the time that show went, out, went off the air, I heard his voice doing voiceovers for Volkswagen. And, you know, it's like, it's like yes. amazing. It's just, so uh, it's, I think that, an, this is the way of answering your question, yeah. that that guy created a, helped us create a character. You, know? you have to be open to see those, yeah. to be there for that moment. You once said to me that you really couldn't have written The Sopranos until you became a father. What did you mean? Yeah, it occurred to me that um, as much as immersed as I've been in all my life in um, mob stories, watching The Untouchables with my dad and all that other stuff, and growing up in Jersey and reading these, you know, I was riveted by stories of bloody sheets, you know, got somebody under a sheet on the floor of a restaurant. I couldn't take my, I love that stuff. Yeah. I couldn't, have the, the, I couldn't have done The Sopranos, and I, this occurred to me very late, not late recently, that unless I had had a kid, because it's really about, it's really in a way about kids, because Tony Soprano is Livia's kid, mm. and, and his, kids. his kids are probably the only normalizing influence in his life. So really the family is what really is the key to the whole thing. Yeah. Parent, Parents and children, and that connects, for example, to the ending of the first of the first season, the ending of the, first, the last episode, when he toasts the good moments. That connects to the ducks leaving at the thing. There's an ele element of ele elegy to this series. Uh, was that conscious? It's an elegiac no. feeling to it. No, it's not conscious. But do you do you notice it? In a sense of, uh, well, maybe, maybe. I think I'm. I just think I'm kind of hung up on death. <laughs> I do. I think I. I you know, I. It's con I constantly and have to remind myself. Things? No, that. Yeah, it's all. It's. It, mm -hmm. It's going to be gone. Interesting about the self-consciousness of some of the characters, like Christopher's need for celebrity and wanting to be famous. Uh, everybody quoting mob films or commenting on them. Is that part of? the demythologizing of this? Yeah, really, it really definitely is. I mean, I just, I had heard that. Well, t I mean, to talk about mob, you know, mob films, it, way after I was involved with, with The Sopranos, maybe in the middle of the season, it occurred to me that this was not a period piece. Goodfellas, when it was made, was a period piece. It was, mm -hmm. about, it was made in the 90s, it was about early 90s, 80s, whatever. It was about the 60s and 70s. Mm -hmm. the Godf these are the big benchmarks to right, these movies, right. the contemporary ones. The Godfather was made in the 70s. It was about the 40s mm -hmm. and 50s. And then I thought, oh, God. And these are the ones I was hoping on some level to be in that neighborhood. Mm -hmm. I thought, but this is right, about right now. And then I, and I, that came as a shock to me. Um, and then I thought, then I'd heard that wise guys were very taken with those movies, particularly the Godfather movies. And it was it was very much a part of, that was just a, a desire to, again, just talk about America, I guess, how much influence we are by, by, movies, by movies and by media. Yes. That, that life, that, uh, you know, life has become more and more artificial or something. And that well, you succeeded. Um, the priest, Father Phil, and his closeness to the two women, I think it's rather daring uh, in terms of the church. Uh, do you agree with Carmilla's evaluation of him in the last episode? Yes, I do. Yeah. <laughs> I do. And that all, the priest all came about because I had heard, I guess there was a, uh, I don't know which one it was, maybe it was The Last Dawn, some, one, of the, one of the later Puzo books that CBS bought and did, and they did Bella Mafia, and, and I think they had the, the, the mafia wife go into bed with the priest, and I thought, Oh, it's such so tacky and sensationalistic. So let's invent a priest that she can not go to bed with. <laughs> but there's a hint of something. Something, but they right. don't. But, but they don't do it. And actually, so, after, so actually, Father Phil, people say, "Oh, the Sopranos, what a scummy world that is." But Father Phil is a guy who 
wants to screw that woman but doesn't. Yes, well, that's admirable. He <laughs> sticks by his code the way Tony yeah. sticks by his. By his, yes, that's very interesting. But there's a powerful use of dreams in the f show, and even more so in the second season. How did that come about? I don't, I'm a big Bunuel fan. <laughs> really? That's you can really tell that in the, in, in the, now that you mention it. I really like, yeah, I mean, nobody can do dreams as well as he can. Yeah. I think. And David Lynch, I think, does a great job. And I just have always, I just, to me, there's always been a link between movies and dreams. It, well, there it, is, isn't there? They seem to be very similar. Yeah. Or that maybe movies, and then this isn't a movie, it's a TV show, but it's shot on 35 millimeter film. It uses the same cameras, equipment, yeah. techniques. That, that actually, they come closest to uh, the, mov the movie thing when it was invented, I think. I think people, it was a way to actually capture that dreamlike state. Yeah, Orson Welles think referred to movies as a ribbon of film, a ribbon, ribbon of, of dreams. Ribbon of dreams. Well, I thought it was Truffaut. Maybe it was true. I read Truffaut. who quoted him. A ribbon I of dreams. It was Orson that said it's a really, ribbon of dreams. It is. Right? Yeah. That's to me. That's the that is the definition of it. Yeah. Uh, is the this kind of straight classic narrative style of the of the direction? Is that something that was discussed among the direct uh, when you discussed with the other directors, or it's, certainly it's it's there. In the pilot episode, that it's oh yeah, yeah it was yeah we so you with every TV series. I mean, the, if it's if if if, it's, if the pilot has turned out okay, you try to give it a visual style that's a, similar to the pilot. Yeah, right. So you set the tone. Yeah, that's uh, not just this show. That's everything. right. Um, how much rewriting and re-editing do you do as the creator of the show? Per, um, uh, I episode usually by episode. It depends. Basis. The writing. I usually take a pass. Sometimes I've had to rewrite stuff a lot. Sometimes, and more and more now, I don't rewrite quite as much because everybody's, you know, the writers, everybody, we're kind of all, we're all in this, at the same place now or in the same page, I mean. So you mean you were rewriting stuff even when you didn't get credit for it? When you oh, always. That's, but that's the nature of a television um, right. executive or for television director. So they, they, you know, even on most TV shows, when you see different names, mm -hmm. by and large, there's one or two people who are, Doing a lot of rewriting, mm -hmm. and you don't, no, they don't, they don't, don't always take credit. Don't always take credit right. for it. Um, and the editing is a lot. I do all the editing, and I've selfishly kept that from myself. And in fact, I thought my colleagues at one point would say, "You know, screw you. Why, why don't we get to edit?" Mm -hmm. And they haven't done that. And I really, really appreciate that. I just love that part of it. And I just, um, I'm sorry to say, I haven't wanted to share it. Well, it, 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 it probably that's what gives the overall series such a. Uh, uniform quality and a and a, a lot of it's done in the I, we change things around we change the stories around mm -hmm. and, and then the music sort of melding with the th it's yes. all there and it, it, yes. so I, it's easier if one person's eye well it has to be and I think that's one of the things that makes the series so personal it, it has a vision one person's vision but I've always felt guilty about the fact that don't the other producers don't, <laughs> don't, don't get guilty. to edit and they've been really they've you know they haven't squawked about it um do you feel any obligation to the fans or to, to 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 what's been successful for the public? Does it occur to you, or do you try to fight that thought? I try to fight it. Good. Um, there's a line in the show about uh, in the, one of the episodes in the first season of Cunilingus and, and, and psychi psychiatry us to this. have caused all the problems. This is a pretty outrageous. Uh, true, it's true though, and. Uh, that going down on a woman or going to a psychiatrist or anathema, why, why is that? What, what, is that a primitive... In that world, prim I guess. Why? Is that a, such a primitive... Is it a, it's a sort of primitive... Act. We actually, we actually as, far as, the, as far as the cunnilingus aspect of it, we actually included an explanation of that in a show called Boca, mm -hmm. in, which, in, yeah, which, she explains in which the going down on a woman created this... In, see, what, what it was was I wanted to do, it, wanted to do a mob show, but... Also, I wanted the, the friction from, and Tony and Junior have these business antagonisms. Right. But somewhere along the line, it occurred to me that I really wanted it to be over something really s ridiculous, like the fact that Tony laughed because Junior went down on a woman. That's what caused these guns to be drawn. So you're saying the fall of Rome was caused yeah, by, by exactly. something <laughs> very minor. And I think that does happen with people. You know, personalities happens. rub against each other. But we had talked to a guy who had been, who was a connected guy, who had said, that there was a big taboo against um, going down on a woman. And we actually quoted him. He said, the theory being, if you'll suck pussy, you'll suck anything. <laughs> and that's a line in the show. Yeah. yeah. 
So, you know, um, and, I, and Frank Renzulli, as I said, kind of bore that out, said, yeah, it is, it's not, not looked upon as a good thing to do. In the house at one point, Tony says, in this house, it's 1954. Is that also true of gangsters, or, or just of certain, or, of a, of a, or is it true of a certain class of uh, in America that there's an old-fashioned aspect? I don't know anymore. I think I think that's true specifically of. I think it's true specifically of Tony Soprano. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting. There's this kind of it's an old-fashioned thing, but you pick that up in some of the other gangsters as well. It's a kind of an they old, are old, they are old kind of old-fashioned old fashioned. on a certain level. Are, uh, about certain things, they are they are old-fashioned. Mm -hmm. uh, they always they always claim the, the moral high ground mm -hmm. um, for things that are personally inconvenient for them. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's also a very good thing about the 20 million Italian Americans who are not in the gangs who are hard-working, decent people. What's your attitude to the glorification of the, of the mob? The, which the glorification of the mob. Hmm. This is a long, long answer, and it shouldn't be, because I have, I have serious disagreements with the Italian anti-defamation people, if that's what you're saying, if that's what you're asking me. Um, well, you, which you deal with in one of the episodes. Every once in a while we deal with it. Mm -hmm. And I knew it would come up, mm -hmm. and I think it's, I think it's, uh, I don't know how to explain my feelings. It's just a long, it's a long answer. I don't know if you really want to hear it. Can you put it in a nutshell? I think the Italian-American experience is an advertisement for America, mm -hmm. for, for, for the democratic experiment. Mm -hmm. It's hard for me to think of a group who's come from so little, who's done so well. Some of my grandparents who came over here from southern, and I'm talking about southern Italy. We're not talking about the Tuscans, and we're not talking about the Romans. We're talking about people from southern Italy who came over here in the early part of the century were illiterate. They knew less than people coming across the border from Mexico who can read. Okay, um, they have done spectacularly well, I think, in America. That's what I mean that they're an advertisement for yes. for the, the the American capitalism. Mm -hmm. If you if you, are, you have so little self-esteem at this point that these movies bother you, I, I have to wonder why. Also because this, this Italian mob thing has become, for whatever reasons, a national myth. Mm -hmm. So to be pecking it apart, this, does, this, this, this is a shame on the Italians. I, I don't, do, they, I, do you understand that this is a, for some reason, the, entire, the whole of America has taken this story onto themselves. That's what true. is it about us? That has allowed that to happen. What and is it because we kill? You can see plenty of killings and vulgarity. That has nothing to do with it. And in the end, I think if your self-esteem is that shallow, and you have a problem with the fact that this tiny minority called gangsters make it tough for the rest of us, I think you should take your case to them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, that's a good answer. I don't think it'll happen, but I think that's what you should do. Um. There's, but this, coming back down to the conservative streak or the old-fashioned thing, Silvio calling the teacher a degenerate for having sex with a stu student, but and yet he's a he's a killer. Right. Uh, again, it's a, there's a lot of irony in that. Yes, there is, and that's part of what that conscious irony that it's you guys, that very you guys are working it's on. It's very conscious. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about the line of psychiatry and canillingus has brought us to this, I had my doubts. I felt that's a very I wrote that line, and I think it's a very self-conscious written line. I couldn't resist it. Yeah, but it's, but it's it marvelous <laughs> the way it puts it on. I just couldn't resist it. And it, and it, and it, could, have, it could have bombed yeah, well, because it's, it's very arch I think if it's, you think about it. I think it's great. Uh, going to that teacher-student situation in, in the, I guess it's episode nine, I, I guess, Boca, uh, where it, cr it creates a very un, un, unusual uh, tension because the audience almost wants the teacher to be killed. Yeah. And based on movie conventions and gangster conventions, it's, you sort of want it because mm -hmm. it's so he heinous. Mm -hmm. And the fact that it doesn't happen, the fact that Tony sort of seems to change his attitude because of what happens, that, that's very interesting. It's a kind of, it's interesting, uh, it, it's interesting what that does to an audience. That was a very, very difficult show to wrestle to the ground. And when, I think when in his first draft, I think he did kill the guy. 
Then we thought, no, he can't. He's not going to kill us. What is he? He's not going to kill a soccer coach. We don't want him to do that. And and we were already into it, and it wasn't working. And we had to keep working and working and working until we finally found, like, hope, the truth of it. It was, it was wonderful the way it was resolved, but it's interesting how how an audience is made you can an audience can want a kill a killing Even I think I think there's a, people have said you know a lot of people have said there's a certain wish fulfillment with mob movies. that's one of the people, reasons people like them is the idea that um, you could say to someone this guy has disrespected me take care of it we all have that fantasy yeah. Yeah, and getting think, a Sherman tank and yeah, blowing we, up exactly. your enemies. And we think <laughs> that the guys in the mob can actually do that, whether or not they do, I don't know. Uh, you, we, we talked some time, some time ago, you, you quoted a line from Jean Renoir's The Rules of the Game, one of the great films, that everybody has their own good reasons. I thought the line, you, you had, I thought the line was the problem with life is that everybody has his reasons. Something like that. Yeah, right. yeah I think that is the line. Um, is that, uh, that theme, something that has been a conscious part of this series? Yes. I mean, I didn't think when we set out to, we started to start doing it, I didn't think, oh, let's do, let's, let's do right. an elaboration on Jean Renoir's line. But I, now when I look at it, that's what goes on in The Soprano House and, and in every aspect of the show, is that everyone has his, everyone has his reasons. Yeah. And they, you can't, everybody thinks he's right. When I go through life, that's what it, that's what it seems like. Everyone thinks they're right. Yeah. Well, when you as actors always have to be on the side of the character, right? And that's another another element. Tony gets pissed off at Christopher for shooting quote he says a civilian in the toe. Uh, is this back to Ben Siegel's comment that we only kill each other, or whoever it was that said that? Is this uh, is that a part no, of? No, it was it was um, it was a. Um, that was a pure business thing. Why bring a negative attention on yourself? But isn't it true that the the, the, the mob, in the sense that they basically only kill other people within their own, like the in, in the second season, he talks about this is a war and we're soldiers, and you know soldiers have to kill sometimes. I guess the majority of people they kill are their own enemies. But whether they're not necessarily in the mob, I think they could kill associates who are not. Mm -hmm. In fact, they have very rigid rules about not shooting. You can't, you know, you can't kill a, a made guy. That's that's one of the advantages to being a made guy. Mm -hmm. Theoretically, you can't be killed unless the boss gives permission for it. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think about the, 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 the interesting, the black mafia, this Jewish family mafia confronting the Italians in the, in the music business? That, that, is that based on history? It was, ba um, it was based on, a, not that there was a black, a Jewish mafia, it was the character of Hesh was loosely based on a on a guy in the record business mm -hmm. who I uh, see. Um, who was a record producer, um, but had very close ties to I forget which family it was, and, and an FBI guy had said if he had been Italian he would have been a captain in the one of the New York families, but mm -hmm. he wasn't, and so he's a famous guy. I mean he produced right. <clears throat> a lot of fam you know hits in the in the sixties. Is there a kind of working between the? Th the two? I don't think so. Not anymore. Not I think really. there was in the in. Yeah. The, I don't. Know, I don't know if the music business has anything to do with the mob anymore at all. Well, but when, in its fledgling pop, you know, in the fifties and sixties, the payola and all that. Yeah, did. it's interesting that comment of Paulie's about cappuccino, and, and then he steals a coffee pot because he's so annoyed that <laughs> that uh, they stole right. this from the that the goy the the the, the, um, <laughs> the goys the goyim stole it from the right. Italians. Uh, that and and the thing about the music being controlled by the by the Italians. This, this is do you, how do you feel about that? Well, that's I mean, as an Italian American, mm -hmm. lately I've been, you know in the last ten years. I mean, I remember when I, there was Italian food in my house, and there was Italian food in my cousin's house, and there was Italian food at a few restaurants. Now you can't walk down. You can go walk down a street in Utah and see trattorias and buffalo right. mozzarella, <laughs> and it's <laughs> and I think it's great. But at the same time, I think to myself, you know. I'm actually very proud of the fact mm -hmm. that this cuisine is probably the preeminent cuisine in America right now. If you go to street in New York, there's like five Italian restaurants on every block. Well, that's the best food. It is good. <laughs> <laughs> David, I, David, I noticed you wrote the, the uh, by yourself the last episode. Uh, is that because it was difficult to wrap it all up and you took the job um, on yourself? I, I, I wanted to do it. I think... 
I thought it would be fun to do. I, I mean, I'd started it, I'd done the pilot, and, I, and secretly I wanted to do the last episode. Mm -hmm. But there were also logistical reasons why it happened. At the end of the season, you know, you just, it's like the fall of Saigon. You're just trying to get through it, and you're holding onto the helicopter. And because I had started the show, it would take me, I could write that show quicker. Because you knew it. Because I knew it. So that was the, and we were, you know, everybody else was trying to do everything else. We were just trying to finish. Right. And so that's how it happened. It's brilliant. I have to tell it you. was a lot. It turned out to be fun for me. Yeah, it was, it was one of the best episodes. Um, the mother's crooked smile at the end is a terrifying scene. Uh, is that based on something? No, not at all. Not at all. The New Yorker said that the series gives one something to think about. Uh, the ambiguity of the characters, the dark comedy. Uh, you definitely decided to push the envelope in this series. I did. I did. And, and by doing that, you have given people something to think about. Um, it would seem that way. People seem to really like it. And, and you know, and I was, I, I, was, I was really glad when the, when the show first debuted, the, the kind of stuff that was written about it, to me, was interesting. Mm -hmm. It seemed like that the, what, the journal, what TV critics and journalists are writing about it was, they were giving me food for thought, it was, or us. They saw things that we had never really intended, but which were obviously there. It was. It was. It, I really felt that there was a um, a connection. Mm -hmm. Did that help you in the second season? In the second season, we were so terrified that <laughs> we were really that because it, we, it had been such a made there was such a big hoopla yeah. that we were just petrified. How do you top that. it? Yeah, well, you didn't have to top it. You just did it just well, as well as well. well. It, was, it was terrifying. The uh, the New York Times called it a masterpiece, uh, and I concur. Um, <laughs> But um, the, the, the fact, about this, what they talk about is the human failings, America at a crossroads, violence in the country is part of our culture. Is there some comment you could make about this um, to sum it up? No, I really, it's in the show, my feelings about all of it. Mm -hmm. And I guess if I was, if I wanted to just talk about that stuff, I, I'd be in a, in a different business. I'd be a sociologist or something like that. Well, the the um, supposedly good art has has says what it means within within itself, and it does. Well, thanks. I mean, I think you you know you just start to, it starts to get watered down because because you know any particular scene isn't only about one thing. I mean, you know how this works, yes. and, and then it becomes pigeonholed into. A well, that's one of the great things about the series is that each scene and everything in it is about seems to be about more than just one thing. It reverberates in a lot of different areas. That's the kind of movies I like. Yeah, me too. I noticed that. <laughs>